Hey guys. So, I thought we'd do something a little bit different for this channel. I've uploaded a few streams, and... I'm thinking maybe I need to upload a few videos to maybe garner a little bit of interest and maybe give you guys something a little bit different to watch. So, what I'm I thinking the greater is a basic tutorial. I don't know who, who necessarily needs this, but I'm sure there are people that are new to Total War Warhammer 2. And this game can be somewhat confusing. So what I'm going to do is give you guys a little bit of a guide. Now we're starting a high elf campaign, but this is more of a general guide. So I'm I'm going to try not to go into race mechanics, into individual race mechanics, that is. I'm going to try to cover more general mechanics for the game to give you to give any newcomers to the game a little more of a leg up because I know for me personally when I started playing Warhammer 2 I had no idea what I was doing absolutely no idea and it was only after I played the game a little bit experimented with it a bit to your and you know made mistakes <clears throat> that I was able to figure the game out so don't look at this this is high elf specific so we're not going into this right now um, I might in addition to this video start putting out individual race guides essentially I guess and I'm gonna be doing this on normal difficulty I've I'm guessing most people who just bought the game and just start out with it don't immediately jump into the higher difficulty settings so most people that just bought this game probably play it on normal unless you're a masochist and you decide to go just straight to legendary which if that's you, I salute you. Um, good luck. Legendary difficulty is not fun. But if you can handle it on your first campaign, good job. Good job. I've been playing Legendary difficulty for a little while now, and it's... Eh, legendary difficulty definitely gets its name for a reason. So, it's not a walk in the park. So... <clears throat> now, for anyone who has never played any Total War game, this down here is your turn timer. Warhammer 2 is a turn-based strategy game, so you do all your, uh, you do whatever you want on the campaign map, you can move your armies, you can recruit units, build up settlements, recruit heroes, recruit new armies, all that in the space of, a, of one turn. And then when you're done, then you go over and hit end turn. And then it cycles through all the AI factions. The AI factions get to make their movements, move their armies, maybe attack you, maybe not, maybe you retreat from you, build up their settlements, build up their areas, maybe search ruined settlements like this, do all the things that you were just doing, move their heroes, and then their turn is done. And then it moves on to the next, and to the next, and to the next, and to the next, until it comes back to you again. So... <clears throat> With Total War Warhammer 2, and this started, I believe, in... I believe it started in Rome 2. They went to the province system. Every game before then, I believe, had each individual settlement, so like Lothar, for instance, was 
just its own entity. There was no Eatane province. And a province is a group of settlements. So Lothurn is a settlement, Shrine of Assyrian is a settlement, right now it's a ruin. So there's no buildings. Tower of Lycian is a settlement, Angiril is a settlement, and all those settlements together colloquially make a province. And a province can have one, two, three, all the way up to four settlements. And when, if you control all the settlements, so if we controlled Lothurn, which we do, Shrine of Assyrian, Tower of Lycian, and Angeriel, we would be able to put down a commandment, which right now we can't, it's grayed out because we don't own all the settlements in the province. But you can issue a commandment once you own the entire province, and it can give you specific buffs. So, Banish Corruption, for instance, gives us Untainted in the local province, so the whole area. This would give us, Rally Citizen Militia would give us Recruit Rank for all units and local recruitment capacity. So, for Shield instance, the right now, we can recruit three units. Each of these little boxes is one. So, we see those will all get done in one turn or one batch of recruitment. That'll start up a second batch. Now, if I had... Let me click those off. If we had Is Rally Citizen Militia, we would be able to recruit those four archers in the space of one turn. Rebuild Lost Splendor saves you 10%. That's construction cost minus 10% for all buildings. And growth plus 20. We'll get to growth in a second. So construction cost, again, if I own the whole province, instead of costing 2,000 gold for Lothurn Elven Village, it would cost us 1,800. So you can save quite a bit of money if you issue that commandment. Tribute to the Phoenix King gives you in income from trade, faction-wide, so your whole faction, you can trade certain goods. So let's just say, for example, you're making 2,000 gold from trade. What's 4% of 2,000? That's 80, if math serves me. Math doesn't always serve me. But so you would make an extra 4% of however much money you're making from trade, and then you would make an additional 3% tax rate in that province. So in this area we would be making 3% extra on top of, so it would be taxes are at 100% right now, it would be 103%, essentially. And I don't believe I'm going to edit this video, I kind of want it just to be just here you go, here's everything, partially because I'm new to using OBS and Eventually I will get better. Eventually I will kind of figure it out and I'll be getting better at editing and all this so these videos will get more professional quality. Right now I've been using OBS for about two weeks so I am by no means an expert in OBS. So if I ramble on on some things Feel free to let me know in the comments if that's the case, I apologize, but yeah, this video is basically just raw, unedited. I just want to get my thoughts out there and help you guys figure out how to play this game, because this game is amazing. So, yeah. Okay, so, <clears throat> we already covered the province system, and what you can do with ruined settlements like Shrine of Assyrian. Standing well, by. Let's let's see, okay. If we click on a hero, or Lord's gonna do Defend this too. But normally I do this with my heroes. <clears throat> Your armies have out here this yellow this yellow ring, this yellow border. That is going to show you how far this army, Tyrion's army, can move within the space of a turn. So it can move all the way over here, and as soon as you start seeing red, 
than that red is okay yeah he can't move anymore this turn anything in the red will be applied next turn he'll start moving that far he'll move into that whatever yeah he'll move up to the yellow here and then the next turn he'll start moving into the red if you want him to and Stand same by. thing goes with heroes he has that yellow border he can move all the way up to here and then the red starts the next turn if we do this he can move all the way out here all the way he can cover this whole thing in two turns and then up here where it starts going this kind of light bluish color that would be the third turn so this just shows you how far you can move in a turn <clears throat> and this guy can be annoying uh, you don't really need to pay attention to him too much he just after a couple times you'll just want him to go away but that's fine so yeah let's say goodbye to him so with Total War Warhammer 2 Ready for order. in previous Total War games such as uh, I believe it stopped in I'm not sure which game it stopped in because I haven't played all the Total War games but for instance um, the oldest newer Total War game if that makes any sense that I've played is Rome 2 and so let's just say from Rome 2 on I'm sure it happened in earlier games but I'm just saying from my experience but anyway in Warhammer 2 you have to have a general commanding an army you have to you can't just have this white line of Krace leading the army. It won't happen. So, and you also can't, in games like Medieval 2 and Rome 1, you could move units. You could separate units. I shall go. Can't do that. Tyrion, yeah, this is all one army. It can never be split up. It can go down in strength. You can disband units, but you can't remove units. You can merge two armies together. So if we had Tyrion with... He's got 7 out of 20. 20 is the maximum, unit, is the maximum size for an army in the Total War games. This, this 7 right here, is how large your army currently is. An army can have up to a maximum of 20 units, including any embedded heroes. So, for instance, if I, I take Tyra here, I'm assuming his name's Tyra, I'm, or Tara, I'm not sure. But if we right click onto Tyrion's army, it shows us what, if you embed Tara, I'll call him Tara because Tyra's kind of a feminine name. And this is a guy, obviously. So, Terra, if we embed him into Tyrion's army, he will give us the following benefits. Increased replenishment of the parent army by 8%, and it says positive outcome 100%, this action cannot fail. Certain hero actions have a certain amount of percentage chance of success or failure. So, if, for instance, we went and right clicked on Tower of Lycian, he can secure influence on this, <clears throat> which is a high elf mechanic, so I'm not going to go into it too much, but we'll just go over the agent action. So, secure influence, um, you gain three influence per turn, so for high elves again, but let's just ignore that yellow, the text in yellow. Let's go down to positive outcome. It has a positive outcome of 65%, so 65% chance of success. Negative outcome, so failure, his chance in the red is 35%. So basically a 1 in 3 chance that this action will fail. 2 in 3 chance that it will succeed. So if you're into dice rolls, there you go. Hero failure, it's a 31% chance that if we did that, it would just give us a message that it failed. It didn't work. Sorry. 
hero wounded underneath that, there's a chance that if I did, that if I went over to Tower of Lycian and tried to secure influence, he would actually get wounded in the attempt. And you'd get a message, it's, uh, I believe it's critical failure. And I get a lot of those with my luck. I see, I see way too many critical failures in my campaigns, unfortunately. And it's very, very frustrating. But <clears throat> at the same time, it's, it, it's not that high of a chance. There's a 4% chance that it'll happen. So 1 in 25 that he'll actually get critically failured. And then he's gone off the map for a certain amount of time. Usually it's about four or five turns. And unless there's any circumstances that change that. And we might get into that in a little bit. But, so let's exit out of this, hit that. So, if we, <clears throat> so what he does is he replenishes, increases the replenishment rate of the parent army by 8%. So Tyrion's army has a certain amount of replenishment, I believe it's 8%. Is just the base replenishment rate for armies. If you sit inside a settlement or go into encamp stance, which we'll get into stances in a little bit because it does get kind of weird with the races and who can do what. But base replenishment rate, I believe, is 8%. If you go into a settlement, I believe you get an extra 10% replenishment, so it would go up to 18. And Terra here increases replenishment rate of the parent army by 8%. So, Tyrion's base replenishment rate, if his units were damaged, they would replenish at a rate of 8% per turn. And if we put Terra in, it would increase it by 8%, so it would go up to 16. <coughs> Excuse me. And down here in the second box, your success rate, or your success chance, sorry, is the total of the actions, base chance, and any effects, rank, item, skills, or temporary effects that your hero or the target possesses, or possess. Base chance, 65%, your hero's effects, plus 0%, target effects, plus 0%. There are certain, as your hero levels up, he'll get extra success, success chance in doing agent actions. The ones that can actually fail. The ones that cannot fail, you can't go over 100%. It can't happen. So, yeah. But for the ones that can fail, this would go up from 65% to possibly 66 or 67. And if we open up if we click on this one, this is your character's level. So rank one, skill point breakdown, character skills, battle skills, campaign skills, we haven't put anything into there. Current experience require current experience. And then slash required for next rank. So if he had 899 experience, he would only need one or more addition one more experience point to advance to rank two. The maximum level for heroes or lords in Warhammer 2 is currently 40. In Warhammer 1 it was 30, I believe. And in Warhammer 3 it could go up to 50, they could keep it at 40, who knows. I'm hoping they'll increase it, but we'll see. Only Creative Assembly knows that. So, if we click on this one here, this shows us your character's stats. So you have armor, how resistant a unit is to missile fire and melee attacks. So the more armor, the more damage they can resist. So less armor, your unit will take more damage. More armor, it'll take less damage. Fairly straightforward. Leadership is basically, think of it as morale or morale in Rome 2 and, or no, Rome 1 and Medieval 2. Sorry, I <laughs> mixed those up. And so a unit with high leadership is less likely to rout in the face of danger. Leadership is improved by experience in battle. As your units fight, 
and take damage and certain other effects, their leadership will go down. It'll go from 75 to 60. Once your unit hits zero, then they can start routing. They can start routing just means they break, they run away, and after a certain amount of time, their leadership will go back up, this bar will refill, and they'll join the fight again. And we'll go into leadership and all that in the battles section. This might, we might do a campaign section and then a battles battle section in another video possibly because campaign does take a while to wrap your head around this game like i said can be somewhat complex especially for people who have never played the newer total war games so speed this is how fast the unit moves just pretty straightforward higher number he's faster lower number he's slower melee attack this determines the chance of a successful hit on the enemy when the unit is engaged in melee. Battle-hardened troops will gain experience through melee, improving this skill. Melee attack, so just like the game explained it, is the chance to hit something. So if you played, I believe in Dungeons and Dragons, which I've never played Dungeons and Dragons before so I could be completely wrong with this, but you roll to attack something and there's a chance that you could hit it, that you'll land a successful hit. This is somewhat the same, th this is kind of similar. So it's not necessarily a 42% chance, it's the higher melee attack, the higher this number is, the better chance your unit has to hit something. The lower number, the less likely he's going to hit something. Now if your 42 melee attack hero is going up against something that has, let's say, 90 melee defense, he's less likely to hit that than if he was going up against a unit that has 20 melee defense. And melee de and battle-hardened troops will gain experience through melee improving this skill. As units get experience, you can increase their melee attack. With units, it's through experience ranks, which we'll go into that in a minute. With heroes, it's as they level up. So if he gets into level 2, we can give him Weapon Master. So his melee attack will go up plus 4, and his weapon strength, which we'll get into in a little bit, goes up by 4% of whatever this is. So you can see now it's, it's 42, and then we scroll over it, and it goes those two values go green text and it goes up to 46 melee attacks and now he has a better chance of actually hitting something. And then over here weapon master plus three melee attack so it would go up to 45 but to get blade master you have to get weapon master. So if you unlock that and then on level three you unlock Blade Master, you would actually have 49 because it's plus 4 plus 3 off of a base of 42. So 46, 49, and then any skill that has these little dots here, these are certain ranks of that skill. So if we got him to level 3 and popped Blade Master, this top dot here, or this top this top circle, would fill in. And then at rank 4, let's say I want a little more melee, melee attack, we'll hit that. And that'll fill in. And that'll give us melee attack plus 7. And then the third will give melee attack plus 12. Now that melee attack plus 12, that is the maximum you can get from the Blade Master skill line. It doesn't go plus 3, plus 7, plus 12 for a total of 22. It doesn't work like that. It's, this is the cumulative total. So, first you get plus 3, and then it adds 4 onto that for a total of 7, and then it adds 5 onto it onto that for a total of 12. <coughs> In melee defense is, this determines the chance of a unit being hit 
lost in melee. So, where melee attack is a chance to land a successful hit, melee defense is the chance to essentially block that or just not take that damage, not not take that hit, essentially. It's your, your unit's chance of just getting out of the way, basically. And this starts off at a base, well, for Terra, starts off at a base of 48. So it's a little higher than his melee attack. He's a little bit more of a defender than an attacker, basically. And same thing, <clears throat> as your hero levels up, we can put, this symbol here denotes melee defense, so we can put points into heart to hit and get up to 12 melee defense. And same thing as melee attack, it goes first level plus three, second level plus seven, third level plus 12. So we could give him a maximum using the heart to hit line of 60. And there are various other skills which we'll probably go into when I do a high elf focused video because obviously this is a high elf hero. So these are all, a lot of these are going to be focused more on high elves, especially the mounts and the names of the skills and certain and various other things. Weapon strength here is. The damage caused by a unit's weapon split between base and armor piercing. So every unit in this game has a certain level of armor piercing and non-armor piercing weapon damage. So armor piercing damage is always applied, base damage can be blocked by armor. So they and I'm not sure if I haven't delved into this, but so I'm not sure if base weapon damage 120, armor 80, I'm not sure if that's, you know, 120 minus 80 equals he only takes 40 damage, I'm not sure. I still have to research that, but armor does mitigate base weapon damage. It doesn't mitigate armor piercing weapon damage because it is armor piercing. Armor piercing weapon damage basically ignores armor. So we see base weapon damage 120 so it's a good amount of damage. Armor piercing weapon damage is 220 so he would actually cut through more armor. So he would do in the event of a successful hit would do 220 weapon damage guaranteed, I believe, and then that 120 base weapon damage, I believe it's, it's, the armor is subtracted from that base weapon damage, I believe. Don't quote me on that, I could definitely be wrong on that. But let's just say for argument's sake that it is. So if it's 120 minus 80, he would do 40 damage. So in the event of a successful hit, if that math is correct, then he would do 40 plus 220 for 260 weapon damage. Bonus versus large down here, which unfortunately I can't just imagine my cursors down, down here, but I'm going to be pointing at it with my finger, basically. Bonus versus large. <clears throat> in, in this game, there is certain types of units. There's small units and then there's large units. Large units is anything bigger than a horse, basically. Anything bigger than a horse, he has, you see the sword icon next to a big guy, <clears throat> his bonus versus large is 35. That adds on to his weapon strength. So it would add 35 weapon damage onto that. I believe that's base. I don't believe it's armor piercing. I could again I could be wrong, but I believe it's base. So his base would go up to 135, which if you subtract that from 80 armor, again we're assuming it's additive. It would go down to 75. Yeah, 75. 
math doesn't always serve me. <laughs> so he does a fair amount of damage. And bonus versus large, and there's also bonus versus infantry, but we'll get into that later on. Bonus versus large, this unit inflicts additional damage has an has an increased chance of hitting enemies that are cavalry size or larger. It gives him so it gives him plus thirty five weapon strength. I believe I believe it also gives him plus thirty five melee attack. I'm not sure exactly on the numbers, but so if that were true, let's just say for argument's sake that it is, and again, don't take me as the Warhammer 2 guru. I make no claims to that title. But let's just say for argument's sake that it is. So if his bonus versus large applied 35 extra melee attack to a large unit, his melee attack would go up to, 30, to 77, which would be a really high melee attack, obviously. And... <clears throat> these icons here this one that I'm scrolling over the kind of white that like, looks almost like a uh, like a comet almost this just denotes armor piercing the damage of armor piercing weapons mostly ignores the tar target's armor making them the ideal choice against heavily armored target they often inflict less damage in total though making them less efficient against weakly armored targets and then bonus versus large inflicts additional damage and has an increased chance of hitting enemies that are cavalry sized or larger. So basically, like I said, anything larger than a horse. So anything smaller than a horse would be considered infantry. Or, well, just not large. Charge bonus, this increases a unit's melee attack and damage when charging. Now, Again, I'm not sure if this... I don't believe it. I'm not sure if it adds 22 melee attack when they're charging, so it would go up to 64. But again, let's just say for argument's sake that it is. It might be, actually. I believe it... I believe it is. But, again, I'm not 100% sure on that, so... But let's just say for argument's sake that it, that it is. His melee attack would then go up to 64 when he's charging. When he is... If... He's running at an enemy, his weapon's in his hand, he's not holding a sword, but he's holding a halberd. So he's charging at the enemy going, Rah! let's do this. He runs into him and he has a higher chance of actually hitting them. That's basically what that is. It also increases damage by 22. So I believe that adds on to the base damage. So whatever the base damage is, which is 120, it adds... 22 onto that, so it would become 142. And these down here are just certain attributes, let's call them attributes, that your unit has. So, missile resistance, 15% damage of missile attacks is reduced by this amount. It's fairly straightforward. If you archers are shooting at him and they have the capability of doing a hundred damage let's just say for a nice round even number he can resist 15 percent of that so they would only do 85 damage to him so it helps your lord hero units can have resistance too but it just increases the survivability of that unit they're going to survive in battle a lot longer so you're going to get more use out of them <clears throat> Resilience. This unit is immune to the following types of attrition. Missive Ivress. Not going to get into the Missive Ivress attrition because that's strictly High Elves. But there are certain types of attrition. Let's say you're in the middle of a desert. And nobody likes going into the desert. So you're going to take attrition from basically going thirsty. You're going to lose a certain amount of units or a certain amount of men in that unit in all of your units due to them basically dying of thirst so let's take so let's say you take you take a unit that has 100 men in it for a nice round number 
and you go into a desert region and you take 5% attrition per turn until you leave that desert. Once you leave the desert, then your units don't take attrition anymore. But while you're in that desert, let's just say you're taking 4% attrition, you're going to lose four men out of that unit every turn that you're in the desert. So turn one, it's going to tell you, hey, you're going to lose four men. The men then you hit in turn, go into the second turn, you've lost you've lost four units. Now you have 96. And then next turn, if you're still in that desert, you take 92. Or you have 92 men left. And so on and so forth. So that's essentially what attrition is. Charge defense... The Sorry. Words. Charge defense versus large. When bracing, this unit negates the charge bonus of any large attacker. So, <clears throat> cavalry is charging at him, and he is pointing, you have him pointed directly at the cavalry unit, and he's standing still. He's not moving, he's just standing still with his halberd up in the air, saying, all right, come at me, come at me, come at me. And that cavalry hits him, that charge bonus is going to be negated. It's, they're not going to get the charge bonus. Or it's not going to be as bad. So, he's going to take less damage on the charge, essentially. Encourage. <clears throat> this unit provides a leadership bonus to nearby allies. Units within range of both the Lord's Aura and an encouraging unit will receive the larger of the two bonuses. What this means is... There are certain units in this game that provide encourage as well. M they're more like high tier units once you get into like tier 4 or 5, which we'll get into tiers in a little bit. Like I said, this game can be really complex. So, this might, this might take a while. We might have to do a few videos on this. But, uh, there are certain units that provide this... <coughs> this bonus as well. <clears throat> what he does is he kind of acts like a cheerleader of sorts, I guess. He's standing in, he's standing nearby a, a unit of spearmen, let's just say. And he, he gives, let's say for argument's sake, that he gives an extra plus six leadership to a spearman. And the base leadership of a spearman unit is ready to serve. 70. So he's standing next to the spearman unit, cheering them on, saying, hey, don't give up yet. Their leadership is actually going to be 76. So it's going to take them a little bit longer to get all the way down to zero leadership and just drop their spears and run. Which they don't actually drop their spears, but they just run. So, he's good for having, you know, for keeping your units in line. If your unit start, if your army starts routing, it's not effective. So, keeping your heroes and lords around your units can help their leadership. You know, as long as, as long as they're not actually, as long as the lord or hero isn't routed themselves. Once they route they don't get that leadership bonus, obviously, because no one's going to follow someone who's running away. No one's going to get the leadership bonus. They're, if anything, they're going to run away, too. They're going to want to run away. So, going back to Tyra, or Give Tara. I said we were going to name him Tara. Uh, so we covered charge bonus, we covered encourage, hide, and then we have forest in brackets. This essentially means... Okay, this unit can hide in forest until enemy units get too close. So, that's what it means. Nice and simple. Basically, if you put him in trees, he will hide in the trees. Units won't be able to see him until they get close, and then the jig is up. You've been found. So, peekaboo, they see you, then they try to kill you. And then you fight. Martial prowess. Again, this is a high elf thing, so I'm not going to get into it, really, but it just provides a melee attack and melee defense buff. 
but said I wasn't going to go into it, and then I went into it. Sorry. <clears throat> Battle effects. There are certain traits on your on your heroes and lords that affect units, both positive or negative. And let's get into this one. Again, it's high elf, but this is just for the sake of example. This gives melee attack, so we have the melee attack symbol. Melee attack plus three for spearmen, silver and guard, rangers, archers, and Lothurn sea guard units in the hero's army. Now if it says, now if he's a lord and it says lord's army, then yeah, that applies. Hero's army, if he's not attached to an army, he's not going to attach that bonus because he's not in an army. He's just running around by himself. So he has to be in an army for that bonus to apply. Or that negative. If it's a bad trait, which you can get bad traits in this game, but we'll go into traits in a little bit, he can apply that bone, that negative to your army. So heroes can make your armies either way better or they can make your armies suck. So be careful with traits. It's a real double-edged sword. Campaign effects. This guy, okay, every hero can, has the potential to add bonuses on the campaign map. So even if they're attached to an army, if they're sitting in a province, they're going to add that bonus until they leave that province and move into, and it has to be your province. So if we're in the Eatane province, if we only own Lothurn and he's sitting in Angerial, he's not going to apply any campaign bonuses because obviously we do not own it yet. <coughs> Now, if we own Angerial, and we were, and we could enjoy the benefits of that bonus, we would get that bonus until he left the area. So, if you own all four of these, as long as you're still in the province, which it'll, if you scroll over, if you hover your cursor over, this will tell you there's, up in the top left corner of that window that popped up, there's grass, so it tells you what kind of terrain it is. And then right next to it, it says Tower of Lycian. That's the name of the region. And then Cult of Excess in the right-hand corner. That's the faction that owns it. Underneath that, there's Province Eatane. Terrain, grassland, which we just covered. Untainted, 100%, that's the level of corruption in the settlement and what type of, of corruption it is. We'll get into corruption later on. Winds of magic, it's blowing and it has zero in brackets, so basically all the magic is gone out of that province. Or out of that region at least. And we'll go into magic later on. Like I said, and I'll say this in many times, this game can be somewhat complex. Especially for newer players. Once you've gotten 100 hours into it or even more which I've got I believe it's close to 2,000 hours in this game this game is very easy to get addicted to and you'll most likely fall in love with this game this game has a lot of replayability especially when you get into the higher difficulty settings which again I play on legendary difficulty no two campaigns are going to go alike no, now, there are certain, in every campaign, there's, it follows a certain path, but the steps along the way to that path can be different. You can have, let's just say, you're dealing with, on turn one, you try to initiate diplomacy with a certain faction, and... And one playthrough on Legendary, they say, yeah, sure, let's do this. Yeah, let's sign this trade agreement. Let's make some money. Cool. Let's go ahead and do this. And then you play it. You decide, okay, you know what? I finished my campaign in a day, which you're not going to unless you unless you just know life this game. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> campaigns can get pretty long in this game is what I'm trying to say. 
and let's say in another, let's say a week or two later, you decide to play the same campaign again. You played it before, you've played it for a few hundred turns, you know what's going to happen. Turn one, you initiate diplomacy with the faction that you did before, and in your previous playthrough they said, yeah, sure, yeah, let's do this, they're all for it, let's do this. And then in your second campaign, you go for it thinking, hey, we're going to get this trade agreement, and they tell you to go kick rocks. Or maybe turn two, they decide, hey, we really don't like you, now we're going to go declare war on you. So, good luck. Now you've got a new enemy. So, that's what I mean with this game. There is so much... There's so much different... Yeah, there's so much differential between campaigns. There's so much variation between between playthroughs. On a high elf campaign, you know, you can maybe turn by turn 40, you own all of Old One, all of this area. And no one can stop you. You've got five, six armies and you're invading everyone at will. And no one can touch you, no one can stop you. You're the top dog on the block. Maybe you do another playthrough about a week or two later, or a month later, <clears throat> and you decide, hey, I'm going to start with Tyrion again. He's a good lord. Last time I did this, by turn 30, I owned Ulf 1. I was making buku bucks. Let's do this. And by turn 30, you've got five armies of the Cult of Excess besieging Lothurn, and you lose the campaign. It, that's really unlikely, but... For argument's sake, let's just say it happens. There's a lot of variation between playthroughs. This is basically the point I'm trying to make. No two campaigns are going to be exactly alike. As I said, certain certain things are going to happen in campaigns. Like, if you're playing as High Elves, you're always going to go to war with Dark Elves because Dark Elves and High Elves hate each other. But... You might, in one campaign, by turn 20, consolidate all of Ulthuan, get a few armies, and invade the Dark Elf territory, Nagarond, or Nagaroth, sorry. And in another campaign, it might take you 70, 80 turns to, con to consolidate all of this. And then, by that point, Nagarond's already invading you, and you spend the next... 30, 40 turns in a war of attrition with them, and then you finally beat them back, and then you finally start pushing back into Nagaron itself, or into Nagaroth itself. So, yeah, no two campaigns are alike. So, let's move on before I start rambling. <laughs> I've already started rambling, but like I said, this game is very easy to get addicted to, and it's very easy to fall in love with. I've gotten hooked on this game from almost from day one. And it's just, it's a beautiful game, it's a fun game, it can be frustrating at times, especially on Legendary Difficulty. If you're on Legendary Difficulty, uh, there are certain factions you hate seeing on your diplomacy screen because you know they're going to declare war on you. Like if you're playing as the dwarves and you see the green skins pop up on diplomacy, you kind of roll your eyes and go, oh god, here we go. But... Even even with that, this game is still just so much fun. You can still you you can sit down to play this game and tell yourself, oh, I'm only gonna play an hour, and then four or five hours later, you're hooked and you're right in the middle of a war with your most hated enemy, and you're going, uh, I can't go to sleep now. I can't go to sleep now. I've got them on the ropes. I've got them on the ropes. Let, let me just finish this up. Give me like one more turn. Give me just one more turn. I can finish this war off and then go to bed. So, yeah. You, you can get hooked into this game really quickly. So, let's go into <clears throat> the province system, which we, touched, which we touched on before, and then I kind of ran off the rails a little bit. So... In this little scroll, we'll call it here, it tells us, okay, here's growth. Once growth reaches a certain threshold, population surplus is created. There is no population 
mechanic in, well, uh, there's, it's sort of a population mechanic. It's not, like, you can't click on Lothern and scroll over it and it says 100,000 people live here. There's nothing like that. So, that's what I mean. It'll, the game doesn't recognize that. Basically, there's no, I mean, there is people living in Lothern, but we can't see them. So, the game just considers them non-existent. If that makes any sense. But, so, growth. Once growth reaches a certain threshold, population surplus is created. This can then be spent on upgrading your settlement building, which will open an additional building slot. Left click to open help pages. We're not going to do that. But, <clears throat> so, right here we can see growth. Growth creates population surplus, which is required to upgrade your, set your settlement, allowing you to construct additional buildings. Change per turn, 20. Underneath that, in smaller text, it says buildings, giving 20. Basically, what that means is, <clears throat> in Lothern, or in the province, the part of the province that we control, which is Lothern, there is a building giving 20. And we can scroll over to our main building here, Lothern, which is an elven hamlet, basically, so it's a small city. Small, small building. We haven't built up Lothern yet. We can see up here, which I can't, so I'm going to use my finger as an invisible cursor, so bear with me. Lothern in brackets, elven hamlet, and you can read the description if you want to, but that's fine. Income generated, 100 gold. So this building every turn will make us 100 gold. Public order, which we'll go into in a little bit, but it's giving us free extra public order every single turn. Growth. So down here we have 20 growth coming in. Growth plus 10. So half of that growth is coming from Lothern, or 10 of that growth is coming from Lothern, Elven Hamlet. So the main chain is giving us 10 growth. And we're not going to cover the rest of this right now because we're focusing on growth. And Straits of Lothern, Lothern Port, income generated 300 gold, so every turn it's making us 300 gold. So between those two buildings, it's making us, on paper, 400 gold. But it's not, we'll go into that in a little bit. <clears throat> income generated 300, wink, wink, quotation marks. And then right underneath it, it says growth plus 10. So, there's our 20 growth. And, <clears throat> so, we can see here, growth is zero. So we don't have any growth yet because we haven't ended the turn. Once we end the turn, then it'll increase to 20 out of 375. And in brackets, you have your change per turn. So we're getting 20 growth per turn. And there, are different, and there are multiple factors that increase growth, which we'll go into later on. We might actually make this, because I don't want this, because I, I could turn this into a five hour long video if I wanted to, but I really don't want to. I don't want to make a video that you guys can fall asleep to. I'd rather have it be maybe an hour, possibly, and explain it to you. I'm essentially explaining this as if you literally just bought the game on Steam. You just picked it up, you were looking at your Steam page and thought, oh, Total War Warhammer 2, this sounds cool, I've heard a little bit about it, I have no idea what it is, but yeah, let's play it. And then you jump into it and you're like, whoa, what do I do? So that's essentially what this video is going to be geared towards. Now, if you're a veteran, I'm sure, I hope this video is entertaining, but I'm sure there's going to be a few things that, you know, maybe there are a few things that you weren't quite clear on, weren't quite sure about, that I can maybe clear up a little bit for you. And that way, you know as much about this game as possible. So, that's essentially my goal with this video. So anyway, with growth. We have plus 20, so if we hit end turn and we go into turn 2, 
will have 20 growth out of 375. Basically, when growth reaches 375 out of 375, we will get an extra growth point. So this one will turn into a two. And then, and using that, using that population surplus, we can build up, in this case, Lothurn, but every building to upgrade the main chain building here, so the Dark Hold for the Dark Elves, Dark Hold for the Dark Elves, if we had a city at the Shrine of Assyrian, if it wasn't a ruin, we could build it up. Every building, every main chain building, so the main province chain, primary building in the settlement, requires population growth. So, right here, to upgrade to Lothar and Elven Village from Lothar and Elven Hamlet, we need one population surplus which is subtracted from this. So right now we've got one population surplus. So we can actually, and it has that little hammer, that glowing hammer, saying, hey, you can build this. So shut up, Ninth Legion. You can build this already. Stop explaining it to him. <clears throat> if we click on this, bam. And it, and it tells us this little bar says, this is how many turns it's going to take this little hourglass with a screw with three right next to it. It's gonna take three turns in total and then Lothurn Elven Village will be constructed. So it'll no longer be Lothurn Elven Hamlet, it'll be Lothurn Elven Village. So it'll be and then you can unlock these two spaces here with the locks. These will unlock. This settlement this slot will unlock when you upgrade your main settlement chain building to level two. So then we'll have three free build slots. In settlements where there's a port, this building is always a port. It, you, can, you can never tear it down. You can tear down every other building except for the main chain building, because why would you want to? But for instance, this barracks, if I want to, I can demolish it. And this will provide 600 gold, so if I want to, Bam. Take it away, it'll be gone next turn, and we'll have 4,600 gold if we did nothing else in this turn. So if I just destroyed it and then hit end turn, we'd have 4,600 gold plus this, but we'll go into this in a second. <clears throat> so, we've decided, you know what, I want to use my one growth point to upgrade Lothurn, which in most cases you should do and we'll go over in another video I'll go over how because again I want to make these videos about an hour so I want to make it something that you can sit down over the course of like a long you know over like the course of basically a TV show like a long TV show and sit down get some information without me lecturing you for over an hour which right now has been going on for almost an hour. So I'll be ending the video here in a little bit, but be that as it may. Um, I just want to go over a couple things. So this video, this first video might go over an hour, but I want to keep these videos to about an hour roughly. So we decided to use our population surplus to upgrade Lothurn, the city. Here we have the option to tax the province. And by default, it's checked because you want to make money, so you tax the province. If you're having certain issues, you might decide, you know what, no, I don't want to tax the province, and it'll actually lower our income. If we tax it, that money comes back. But we'll go over income probably in the next video. So, income, and this is province-wide, which right now we only own Lothurn City, so, but if we owned the Tower of Lycian, for instance, and it made 195 gold, that 195 gold would show up in here too. It would show up as, under province wealth, 520, Lothurn giving 520, and then it would show up right underneath the Tower of Lycian, giving 195 for a total of however much that is. I can't math right now. I think it's about 715, I think. 
and here we have <clears throat> and then you have various effects taxes are at 100 percent which public order affects tax rate certain other things affects tax affects tax rate but let's just say for argument's sake that it's always at 100 percent so it's 520 in this case times 100 percent is 120 100 percent of 520 is 520 check with a calculator if you want to i did i didn't really but okay and that was my facebook <laughs> so if you heard that little ding yeah that's that's what that was public order <clears throat> public order details current is zero when you start off the campaign i believe it always starts at zero and then you have change per turn so next turn and it's either positive or negative at the beginning of the campaign it's usually negative unless you have certain things affecting it but change per turn minus one so public order will go down by one point every single turn until you fix it essentially and here we have a little bit underneath it we have buildings providing three and taxes providing a negative four because let's be honest who wants to pay taxes absolutely no one so people are upset that they have to pay taxes but hey you're Tyrion you gotta pay for your army so people gotta pony up that tax money right sorry but we gotta fight the Druki we gotta fight the Dark Elves give me money and so down here it says public order is deteriorating at the current rate so if nothing else changes if that change per turn does not change at all there will be a rebellion in a hundred turns so in a hundred turns from now if you don't fix up your public order so by turn 101 there will be a revolt sitting outside of Lothurn and revolts aren't always a bad thing we'll go into that in a later video but don't always immediately try to fix public order by garrisoning an army in your settlement it can actually rebellions can actually work in your favor especially on higher difficulty settings which I'll go into later on but so if you want to keep public order under control <clears throat> you can do certain things like build certain buildings you can we can move Servant of the Tyrion Tyrion's army into Lothurn and now that minus is now a plus current is zero change per turn is six military presence so that's one of the reasons public order is changing is a total of seven now how military presence works because this I've seen it asked a few times how military presence works basically what it is is you have a province right and in this case we only own Lothurn and Tyrion has Tyrion, a an army size 7 out of 20 so <clears throat> let's just say for argument's sake that we owned all four settlements in the Eotain province and we still had this army size seven it's essentially seven divide or okay, the size of your army divided by how many settlements in the province that you own so if we own all four and we're dividing four or seven by four so seven divided by four is almost two so it should show up as military presence too in that case but since we only own one settlement it's plus seven if his army was size 12 it would show up as military presence 12 and if we put son of Alpha, this guy I am army, a fount of knowledge Alariel's champion it'll become eight so and now, if we own all four settlements, 8 divided by 4 is 2. So, it would be military presence 2. So, public order would be going up 
you'd have military presence 2, buildings 3, taxes minus 4, so you'd have 5 minus 4 for a grand total of 1. If you had the army sitting in the settlement, which I don't always recommend. <clears throat> Unless you absolutely have to do that. Corruption down here, so that's basically public order. And buildings, there are certain buildings that upgrade, that increase your public order. So for instance, Lothurn Elven Hamlet gives us plus three. If we upgrade it, right now it's plus three. If we upgrade it to level two, it gives us public order plus four. So that buildings plus three would actually go to buildings plus four or buildings four for public order. So, and a lot of the main, main settlement buildings do increase public order, and then there are certain buildings which we'll probably get into, we'll probably do it in the next video, because again, this is going over an hour and I don't wanna ramble on all night. But we'll go into buildings next video, more than likely, which, I'll probably do that video tomorrow. Yeah, we'll probably do that video tomorrow. I want to give you guys some kind of videos that you can actually watch instead of just putting up a stream and doing it that way. I want to give you guys something that you guys can, you know, watch over and over again if you want to. If you like the sound of my voice and like, you know, this lecture. So let's go into corruption. Corruption details, untainted. <clears throat> there are certain races in this game that the okay the basic corruption type is untainted <clears throat> it's they're just humans or they're dark elves or they're dwarfs or whatever most races in this game give untainted corruption so they're not well, tainted by anything. I don't know. It, it can be kind of hard to describe sometimes or to explain, but they're not influenced by any, like, by any, like, dark powers. There's no... They're not praying to the Chaos Gods or worshipping the Skaven God or they're not vampires. Whatever. So... Right now, Untainted is at, a, is at 100%. And it's... Underneath it, local populace is giving 4. So it would be increasing by 4 every turn. But... It can't go over 100%, so it's going to stay at 100%. Now, if... Let's just say... Chaos Corruption... <clears throat> in the province was plus six and we only had four local populace giving untainted chaos corruption would start infesting the land and you would actually see the terrain in Lothurn start changing and if we owned the entire province you'd see <clears throat> well you'd still see it but yeah you'd see the actual terrain start changing in the province at all it, it, by its, it, itself so you know you can visually see it <clears throat> and same thing with vampire corruption if vampires set up shop and we had a vampire character giving you know 10 vampire corruption every turn if nothing changed with our local populace, vampires would take over Lothurn. Or vampire corruption would take over Lothurn. So, same thing with Skaven. Um, corruption affects public order. Should corruption become too high, then the forces of chaos, vampire accounts, or Skaven will emerge in the province. A high level of corruption can cause armies to suffer attrition. Skaven corruption doesn't give you attrition unless they also unless they infect you with plague which again I'll probably go into 
at a later video. I'm not sure when, but it'll be at a later video. Because, yeah, I don't want to explain it right now. But just keep that in your mind for later. <clears throat> Chaos corruption, though, if it gets to a certain level, to a certain percentage, every time we're not in a settlement or in a stance, which we'll probably go over stances in the next video, but if you're not in a certain stance or inside a settlement, you'll actually take chaos attrition. You'll take attrition due to your men walking through chaos infested territory essentially. So you'll start losing men every turn until you fix that, until you either get in a settlement where you can replenish or start fixing that chaos corruption, you'll take attrition. Same thing with vampiric territory or with vampiric corruption. You will take attrition until you do something about it. And the corruption will also, as it said, chaos or corruption, sorry, <laughs> affects your public order. So <clears throat> if we start getting, if we start seeing this drop below 100%, we'll see public order, it'll say where it says military presence, buildings, taxes, taxes, giving, it always tells you the additive effects for public order at the very top. And then the negative effects, what's detrimental to your public order underneath it. So it's positives, negatives, right, one on top of the other. So under taxes, like below taxes, there would be another one that says corruption, and it would give a certain value. And then it would tell you underneath whether public order is increasing or deteriorating, or stabilizing, I mean, either stabilizing or, deterior or deteriorating. So, and certain, you know, most races will want to keep untainted in their territory, but for certain races, which we'll get into again in another video, certain races want certain corruption. Like if you're Skaven, you want Skaven corruption in your territory because you're Skaven, why wouldn't you? If you're Chaos, or if you're a faction that follows Chaos, if you're a race that follows Chaos, you want Chaos corruption. If you're a vampire, you want vampire corruption because untainted, would actually hurt you. With Untainted, you'd actually be taking attrition. You'd be taking attrition through walking through the lands of the living, basically, unless you're in a certain stance, which we'll go in later on. Under here, we have province effects. Right now, our province is, our, pop, our populace is indifferent. The population is indifferent, just what it said, <clears throat> and here's the range, public order, minus 25 to 25, so if it's between those two levels, the population is just kind of, eh, whatever. They neither care nor not care, they're kind of apathetic, they're like your standard 14 year old goth kid, they just don't care, just don't bother me, whatever, <sighs> whatever, that. So, yeah, indifferent, it just moody goth elves. Ugh, I shudder at the thought. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, now we get into, okay, campaign land of sight plus 10 for local regions. So, <clears throat> it just increases <clears throat> how far you can see by 10%. Tax rate plus 0%, you're not getting any bonuses because the population is just kind of like, eh, whatever. Who cares? Growth plus zero, because again, the population isn't growing. Nobody is really either either really happy, so they're not having any more invisible elf kids. Recruitment cost plus zero, local armies. So at a certain point, when your public order gets better, you might actually, you know, you'll get recruitment. Your recruitment cost in that province will be reduced by a certain percentage. So instead of costing 500 to recruit an archer, it might only cost you 450, which you're saving money, that's good. But 
on the flip side, if your public order is bad, if it's nearing minus 100%, you probably shouldn't recruit in that province if you can avoid it, because it's going to cost you, instead of 500 gold, it might cost you 550. You're, you're paying more for those units to recruit them. So, you know, try to keep your public order under control as much as you can. And then underneath that, local recruitment capacity, again, once your public order gets better, once it gets closer to 100%, <clears throat> then you might be able to recruit one extra unit in your, one extra unit in your province. So instead of three, you might get four, or it might go up to plus two. So you can recruit five. So you can recruit armies faster in provinces that are happier. So the happier your empire is, the better. You're going to have more tax rate, you're going to have faster growth, your provinces are going to develop a lot faster, your armies are going to be built up faster and cheaper. So it there's definitely a benefit to managing your public order. <clears throat> and I think we're going to end the video on that. Uh, we went over quite a few things. We will probably, yeah, we'll do another video tomorrow and we'll go over a few more things because there's, like I said, there's a lot to cover in this video. And this is just the general mechanics guide. I'm trying to avoid going over individual race mechanics and individual faction mechanics because there's certain <clears throat> mechanics for all the high elves in general and then there's certain mechanics for various factions within those races so like I said at the beginning and throughout the video this game can be very complex but it's also incredibly fun. Sometimes the f the complexity of it is what makes it is what makes it fun. Because if you're just oh, take this army, do this, and then hit in turn, that could be incredibly boring. So it's the amount of stuff that goes into this game, the amount of stuff you can do on the campaign map, even if it's stuff that you're not necessarily thinking about but it's in the background, that's what, that's one of the many things that makes this game such a good game, such an amazing game, and I think we're all waiting for Warhammer 3 just to see what else is going to get put into this game, because this game has improved vastly over Warhammer 1. Warhammer 1 is, it has the same basic structure, but the races were expanded on, the factions were expanded on, new mechanics were added, so this game is only getting better. This game series is only getting better. And I can't wait to see what Warhammer 3 has in store for us. If it if it improves on Warhammer 2, ugh. I've got about 2,000 hours in Warhammer 2. If Warhammer 3 is <clears throat> is twice as good as this game, which I don't even know what they could do to this game to make it twice as good. I'm sure there are a lot of people who have ideas for how they could make it better, but Warhammer 3 will more than likely be better than Warhammer 2, because Warhammer 2 is better than Warhammer 1. If Warhammer 3 is better... Ugh. I'm going to lose so many hours of my life to, the, to that game, and I'm going to love every single second of it, and I hope you guys do too, because, like I said, this game is very easy to get addicted to. It's, you know, if you like outsmarting your opponents, if you like building an empire, because you can conquer. There's a lot of territory in this game to conquer. If you want to, if you want to, you can paint the map. If you've got enough time, you can paint the map and make this all yours. Make this all belong to Tyrion. And when you're done three, four hundred, five hundred turns in, into it, and you own the map, you can look at it and say, I conquered that. 
just me. I did it all by myself. And I hope you guys do. It's I haven't conquered the entire map yet because eventually, I, like I've gotten into campaigns and gotten to a certain point, and then <clears throat> not gotten bored, but because this game is not boring at all. But I've gotten to a point where you reach a point of strength where you're like, okay, who can really stop me? But then again, I play on Legendary Difficulty, which uh, it's, you can certainly be stopped. Yeah, factions can definitely stop you. They, they can spit out armies faster than you can recruit them sometimes. And so, but hey, maybe one day I will do a full map completion. And maybe we'll do it on a live stream and you guys will be there to watch me do it and you guys will be there to celebrate with me as we take the last province, we secure the last settlement, and we put a bow on it and say, all right, we're done, we got it. So, hey, who knows, we'll see. But I will see you guys later on. And let's go ahead and save this actually. So, if you're curious, hit escape, hit save. <clears throat> we'll name this tutorial campaign. And that's going to be it for this video. So, thank you guys so much for watching. Please, if you guys like the content, let me know. If you guys don't like the content, if you feel there's something that I, that, you know, hey, I wish you'd shut up about, I wish you'd stop rambling about, I wish you would just leave it, you know, one and done, let me know that too, because I'm still getting used to this, I'm still getting used to creating content, and the only way things are going to get better is if I know that something's wrong, and the best way to find out if something's wrong is feedback. So, I want criticism. I want, you know, whether it's positive criticism or negative. Whether there's something that you thought, hey, I really like the way you went into that. I really like the way you explained it. So, keep it up. Or, on the flip side, hey, there's some things that you kind of went over a few times and we kind of got the gist of it the first time. So, maybe certain things you can just kind of gloss over and move on that's what I'm looking for I'm looking for all your feedback whether it's positive or negative if you like the video give it a like it I don't believe it helps the well it, I believe it helps the channel in the sense that it helps me figure out if you guys like the content or not if you like the content if, and if you hit like then I obviously know somebody liked it okay cool doing a good job. If more people like it than dislike it, hey, cool, I'm doing a good job. I'll probably keep doing it this way. If more people dislike it than like it, okay, I need to change something up. And if you guys would, leave a comment underneath. Those would be, that would be the best way to let me know, hey, this is what I think you're doing right. This is what I think you're doing wrong. This is what I think you're explaining very well. This is what I think you are explaining a little too well. So, no feedback is bad feedback, so I welcome your feedback. All right, take it easy, guys. I will be back tomorrow, and have a great day or night, wherever it is for you.